Hello. Welcome to this service of meditation, of prayer, and of listening to the words of Scripture so that we might discern more and more what God's will for our lives would be. And now I invite you to go with me as we pray to God. Holy and gracious God, you come to us with words of wisdom and promise, and we pray that you would teach us to know the gifts of our great high priest and lead us to love that is nourishing for all of life. Through your word, O oh God, let your Holy Spirit open our insight, remove our ignorance, kindle our zeal, and bind us to you forever. Amen. We will sing the opening hymn together, and I believe it's one that most everyone knows pretty well. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what a 
a friend we have in Jesus. Our Old Testament reading for this evening is recorded in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, Look, you've been telling me, lead these people forward, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. Yet you've assured me, I know you by name, and think highly of you. Now, if you do think highly of me, show me your ways so that I may know you, and so that you may really approve of me. Remember, too, that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, I'll go myself, and I'll help you. Moses replied, if you won't go yourself, don't make us leave here, because how will anyone know that we have your special approval, both I and your people, unless you go with us? Only that distinguishes us, me and your people, from every other people on the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I'll do exactly what you've asked, because you have my special approval, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glorious presence. The Lord said, I'll make all my goodness pass in front of you, and I'll proclaim before you the name, the Lord. I will be kind to whomever I wish to be kind, and I will have compassion to whomever I wish to have compassion. But the Lord said, You can't see my face, because no one can see me and live. The Lord said, Here is a place near me where you will stand beside the rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I'll set you in a gap in the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll take away my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now I invite you to join your minds, your hearts, and your spirits with mine as together we go to God with our intercessory prayers of the evening. Let us pray for all the needs of the world, saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This evening, Lord, we pray for the Church of Christ and for people of faith who call upon God by other names, that where there is need and division, your spirit will bring understanding and reconciliation. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For the earth, for its minerals, bacteria, microbes, and all that lives and breathes in every size and shape. For the nations, the leaders, the armies, the town councils, the peacekeepers and peacemakers, workers of government. Lord, we pray for voters and for people who work toward democracy. For those who fight against change and those who fight for changes in the name of justice. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For children and for those who are raising children in this complicated time, that in the midst of their common struggles, there will be times of great joy and happiness. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For all who daily show us how to live well and in accordance with your commands, God of mercy, hear our prayer. For all who suffer in our land from hunger, homelessness, poverty, and illness, and especially those we name before you, we pray for the residents of Whitestone who live in the Wellness Center, and especially lift up Joan Fritz, Nancy Sherrill, and Cliff Lemaire. God of mercy, hear our prayer. For all others we hold silently in our hearts this day, we pray that, God of mercy, you will hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for those who have taught us faith, we ask you to hear our prayers and their words of gratitude. Keep us in your care and bring us to the feast that has no end, through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Tonight's meditation is based on a New Testament lesson 
that's recorded in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 through 10. From Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the Thessalonians church that is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to all of you. We always thank God for all of you when we mention you constantly in our prayers. This is because we remember your work that comes from faith, your effort that comes from love, and your perseverance that comes from hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father. Brothers and sisters, you are loved by God, and we know that he has chosen you. We know this because our good news didn't come to you just in speech, but also with power and the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know, as well as we do, what kind of people we were when we were with you, which was for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord when you accepted the message that came from the Holy Spirit with joy in spite of great suffering. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The message about the Lord rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. The news about your faithfulness to God has spread so that we don't even need to mention it. People tell us about what sort of welcome we had from you and how you turned to God from idols. As a result, you are serving the living and true God, and you are waiting for his Son from heaven. His Son is Jesus, who is the one he raised from the dead, and who is the one who will rescue us from the coming wrath. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. Do you consider yourself to be an influential person? Do you know people personally that you consider to be quite influential? And how would you go about separating those who are influential from those who are just regular folks? Let me tell you about two powerful men who lived at the turn of the 13th century. The first man was unanimously declared Pope in 1198, and he chose his papal name as Innocent. Jeremiah 1 verse 10 was his ordination verse. See today, I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Pope Innocent lived by that verse. He believed that his position gave him the power to rule, to rule over all people, and anyone who challenged him was in danger of being excommunicated. He used his position to intimidate kings and other rulers. He declared that King John of England was actually one of his subjects and under his rule. Innocent tried to claim that all of England belonged to Rome. Pope Innocent III has been called the most powerful pope in history, and yet his name is largely forgotten today. Well, during about the same time that Pope Innocent was amassing his power, another man from a tiny town in Italy was giving up his power to take up the cross of Christ. This man named Francis was born to a wealthy family in the small town of Assisi. He had lived a life of ease and self-centeredness until two tragic events occurred in his life. First, he suffered a very serious illness, and then later on, while serving as a soldier, he was taken captive and held prisoner for over a year. Through these sufferings, Francis came to know Jesus Christ, and he dedicated himself to serving Christ among the poor and the sick. In a day when poverty was running rampant, Francis turned his back on his family's wealth and lived as a beggar. He ministered among lepers, even embracing those whom the rest of the world called outcasts 
and unclean. Francis took as his motto, Matthew 10, verses 7 through 10. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of God is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Francis had no power, not as the world would define power. And yet the power of God working through him gave him an influence greater than anyone would ever imagine. Now, in that day, the church had to give its seal of approval for any new religious group to organize. So Francis and a motley crew of followers who were working together in ministry traveled to Rome to gain an audience with Pope Innocent to get their organization sealed. Innocent took one look at the simple missionary standing before him and said disdainfully that Francis should go roll in the mud like the pigs. Well, the pompous Pope had no idea what kind of man he was dealing with. Francis, in all humility, left the Pope's office and went to the nearest pigsty where he rolled on the ground in the mud. He wasn't thinking about his position. His sole focus was on continuing his ministry among the poor and the sick. And if that meant he had to humiliate himself at the direction of the Pope, then so be it. He would gladly humiliate himself. Well, Pope Innocent was so moved by Francis' devotion that he gave his official declaration of status to Francis' ministry. And that ministry continues today through hundreds of schools and hospitals and service ministries that are led by, you're right, the Franciscans. Francis' influence continued for almost 800 years after he lived, up to this very day, because he gave up his power in order to let God's power work through him. Two men. One had enormous power. The other had a much more lasting influence. In any organization, whether it's on the job or in the home or the community, even in the church, there are two kinds of power positional power, and personal power. We do what our bosses tell us to do, don't we? Position does matter. It's also true at home. Children obey their parents. Well, to a point. But there's a difference between the raw exercise of power and influence. Innocent III had power, but Francis had influence. You know, St. Paul is considered by millions to be the second most influential person who ever lived after the Lord Jesus. He's still, after over 2,000 years, influencing the world, and yet he never held a formal position. They say that wherever Paul went, he either started a revival or a riot, and most of the time, let's be honest, it was both. Paul had gone into Thessalonica, a large city of about 200,000 people at the top of the Aegean Sea. Now that Aegean Sea is a little sort of roundish sea that's between Greece and Turkey. And it's kind of like the Mediterranean just kind of swooshes up in there. And Thessalonica is right up there at the top. Acts 17 tells us Paul and Silas began to share Christ in that local synagogue. Some Jews and many Gentiles were converted. Three weeks later, riots began. Why? Well, the leaders of the synagogue brought Paul and Silas before the local magistrates, and here's what they had to say about them. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. These men who have turned the world upside down. Now friends, that's influence. 
Today, more than a billion people call themselves Christians. Most of them due indirectly to the work of these two men. That's influence. Notice that our lesson for this evening's meditation is all about influence. The influence that Paul and Silas had and the influence that the church of Thessalonica had. I read Paul's words our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how he lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Influence. Paul modeled faith for the Thessalonians, and they modeled faith for others. I want us to focus just a few minutes on how one becomes a person of influence. There really aren't many other subjects that are as important. Is there someone you would like to influence? Maybe your own spouse, or a child, a grandchild, a friend other residents here at Whitestone, staff members here. Well, you know, everything we want to accomplish in this life depends on influence. So how do you become a person of influence? How do you leave a lasting impression on others? Influential people actually bear essential characteristics. First of all, people of influence are driven by a passion. You can certainly see that in St. Paul. What was his passion? You can sum it up in one word, right? Christ. While we can see it most visibly in St. Paul, it's invariably true of others. People of influence have a passion. A passion for their family, a passion for their work, a passion for their community, a passion for the church a passion for a Christ-like living. What is it that you're passionate about? You know, if you want to be a great parent or grandparent or great-grandparent, you need to be passionate about it. If someone wants to be a high performer at work, they need to ask themselves whether they really have a passion for the work that they're doing. Influence requires passion. But there's something else about people of influence that has set them apart. They have a respect for people. You can't lead people effectively for good things if you don't believe in them and respect them. Notice again how St. Paul begins this chapter. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. What high praise Paul is bestowing on the people of this church. But he means it. Paul knows that God works through people. That's all God has on this earth, our people, and all kinds of people. And he knows that God has gifted us all in different ways, and he believes that the work of the kingdom is done when people exercise their gifts appropriately. An example comes to mind, and, and that's an older television show you may recall named Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Do you remember Regis Philburn was in charge of that show? He was the MC. I think that he kind of always wore the same color tie and shirt matched up. But anyway, um, do you remember the format of that show? It was very popular. Well, a contestant would start out with multiple choice questions, and they would get more difficult as the game went on. When the contestant was stumped and wasn't sure, the person had a couple of options to help. One, he could ask that they take two of the choices away, and that would give him a 50-50 shot at being correct. Or he could call a family member or a friend that he had previously designated as an expert. 
Or, last but not least, he could ask the audience for their help, and they would poll the audience. Well, they did some research on all of this as the show went along, and the experts did pretty well. They were right 65% of the time, which was better than the 50-50. But here's what was surprising. The audience was right 91% of the time. People are smart. They may do awfully dumb things, but they aren't dumb. And people who influence others know this. They know that in order to be effective, they must help others to use their natural intelligence for the collective good. Because each of us is smart in our own way. Each of us has strengths and each of us has weaknesses. Each of us brings our own particular perspective to any given solution. A person of influence helps to give our very best. A person of influence is driven by passion. A person of influence respects other people, all other people. But there's one other thing. People of influence decide to make a difference. They determine that God has put them here for a reason and they seek to live out God's purpose for their lives. Otherwise, it's just so easy to drift through life. Some of us drifted into our first jobs, and we woke up one day, and there we were. We really didn't plan it. It just sort of happened. For some of us, it worked out really well. But we can't really say it was the result of a life plan. Some of us drifted into our marriages. Some of us drifted into our present state of health. We could have made better choices, but it would have taken too much energy, too much stress. Drifting, drifting along like a piece of wood, being carried down a lazy river, not knowing where we'll land. People of influence decide to make a difference. St. Paul, he made a difference because he made a decision for Jesus Christ. That is the most important decision of all, and we bless his name to this very day. Remember Nero, the emperor of Rome? Well, the emperor Nero had the power, but Paul...